Alright, Mom, we're going live. Okay. Oh, my hair is jacked. Alright, Mom, we're going live. Okay. Alright. Hello, everybody. This is Chris from The Rewired Soul. I'm just going to real quick make sure that this thing works. Hello, everybody. This is Chris from The Rewired Soul. I'm just going to real quick make sure that this thing works. Okay. Here we go. Looks like we are live. All right. All right, everybody. Yes, this is Chris from The Rewired Soul, where we talk about the problem, but we focus on the solution. And I am here with my beautiful mother, Dr. Carrie Randazzo. Say hi, Mom. Hi, everyone. So if you're in here, please um, make uh, let us know if you can hear the audio on here, because this is the first time we're setting up something like this. And yeah, so anyways, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, yeah, so anyways, uh, it's been about a week since the Las Vegas shooting happened. And just to get this thing rolling and kind of what this uh, live stream is going to be about. So me personally, for those of you who don't know, I live here in Las Vegas. And there's the city, I've been here for over 20 years, and I've never seen the city like this. Just... There's this really calm and quiet, um, it's gone on all week, just the gas stations that I frequent and that normal human interaction and stuff. Everybody's just been kind of down, obviously, because of the tragedy. And um, personally, you know, thank goodness, nobody I know was injured, but pretty much everybody I've talked to, because I asked everybody I know, are you okay? Is everybody you know okay? Within one separation, or two separations, somebody knows somebody who was hurt in the incident. One of my friends has two people, uh, two friends, actually sisters, who are in the hospital recovering from the injuries. So one of the reasons that we're doing this live stream is because there's a lot of questions around this, and those of you who follow the news or the media in any form, there's a lot of people throwing out theories, and they're, they're just grasping for any kind of idea that they can to try to find answers. And Rightfully so, the public wants answers. I personally want answers. My friends, everybody here in Las Vegas, as well as around the, the world, is looking for answers. Like, why did this guy do it? What were the signs? How could we prevent this in the future? And a lot of people aren't looking at this from an angle that people like my myself and my mother are looking at, um, which is addiction. So before we get this thing started, um, if you look in the description, I have put a link to uh, the GoFundMe that Casey Neistat, who is a fellow YouTuber, big YouTuber, um, who is running it. Uh, last time I checked, it was at about a two two hundred eighty thousand dollars. And if you would like to donate, please do. That goes to the victims fund, um, the survivors, the families, funeral costs, medical bills, um, all those things. So if you can donate to that, um, but but yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get going. So anyways, let's let's start this thing out with. Uh, mom, talk to me just real quick. And those of you watching, I'm going to call her mom, but she's Dr. Carrie Randazzo, as you can see above. But mom, talk to me a little bit about when these things happen. You were explaining to me how people come up with like a hypothesis, um, people in your field. Can you kind of explain that? Right. There's a difference between, I've been hearing people say, people are coming up with conspiracy theories. There's a difference between coming up with a conspiracy theory and having an educated hypothesis. A conspiracy theory is just, first of all, it's a guess based on something political that's happening in groups. That's a conspiracy theory. In psychology and training, we come up with hypothesis. Um, we're trained to do what we call psychological forensics on a person. We were given case studies, and in school, I remember, we are giving pages of, say, a person's psychopathology, something they did in society. And we were to break it down as in psychological theory to explain their behavior. So making a hypothesis is based on educational facts, scientific facts, and we're putting them together to get a whole complete picture of a human being okay. and their behavior, okay, so, and their thought process. So why do you think, like, me and, me and you have been talking almost every day, like, why, we've, we've even seen, like, I've linked you to interviews with other psychologists and just what the news is saying, like, why do you think so many people... Might and just to clarify to anybody who's just joining us or watching this, like 
we are using the word hypothesis. This is not a, you know, we're not trying to do a conspiracy theory. We're not grasping at straws or anything. And we're trying to show respect to anybody affected by this situation. But it, in our view, it seems like a lot of people are missing a very key factor, which may be that this guy was an addict or an alcoholic. And so, so mom, based on like what, what you've seen, why do you think so many people are not touching on the fact that this guy potentially had a problem with addiction? I think what's bringing me to that I agreed to do this is because I saw others in my profession getting on TV or getting on YouTube and discussing other factors related to this gentleman when we're trained to know, first of all, I want to let everyone know, we have a diagnostic manual that if you come in our office, there are certain criteria you must meet for us to diagnose you with anything, depression, substance dependence, bipolar disorder. There are specific certain criteria. OK, and in that criteria, it states if there is a substance or a dependency of any kind that must be addressed before any other mental health disorder. I'm going to repeat that again in our DSM, our clinical diagnostic books. We are trained and it specifically states in in the book consistently if there is any other type of dependency. Any kind of addicted. And we must address that before we go to any other mental health disorder. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Yeah. So for those of you, and one of the, one of the roles I'm going to play during this, uh, this stream is to kind of break those things down into layman's terms. But yeah, what the book, um, the DSM that my mom's referring to is a diagnostic statistical manual. Basically that's what therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists, that's what they all turn to. to it has a list of symptoms for different disorders. And what my mom is saying is that addiction or dependency must be addressed first. And let's talk about that for a second. Something that we keep seeing over and over is people talking about how this this guy was acting normal. And I think that's a huge <laughs> issue. And that's why I do, I do the Rewired Soul. That's why I started that YouTube channel. Um, because so many people don't even know what addiction looks like. I've seen people throwing around the term, he was a professional gambler. And <laughs> let's, Don't let's, make me laugh. let's talk about that for a second. So people are saying he was a professional gambler. So I live in Las Vegas. I, um, I got into poker for a while. And there are professionals who play poker. Now, this, this guy, this shooter, the killer, he played video poker, a very isolative game. And there are people who worked at the Mandalay Bay and they've come out with statements saying, you know, he sat there just non-social, like a zombie, just maybe not even making eye contact with people for hours on end, just completely zoned in. So, like, we need to really look at the, what we're talking about when it comes to addiction. Like, how do you look at somebody like that and say, that's a professional gambler? Like, for those of you who don't know, my mom is in recovery, too. Um, your, your sobriety birthday is coming up, isn't it? Yeah, in about a week and a half. Okay, cool. Like, I, what's the date? Because I, I kind of forgot. October the 17th. Cool. And how many years is that going to be? 12. 12. So my mom's a recovering alcoholic. Messed around with benzos a little bit. Uh, me um, went from alcohol to prescription painkillers, uh, opiates. And, like, let's just, let's just put this into perspective real quick. I... That would be like me or my friends or if I did something and the news saying, oh, no, 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 this guy didn't have an addiction. He was just a professional opiate taker. Like he was just a professional when it comes to crushing up drugs and snorting them up his nose. He was just a professional. Like we need to start separating the fact and what we're going to go through today. My mom has a slideshow that we're going to be going through um, is what addiction actually looks like. But that we think is why so many people are missing this crucial piece that this guy had a dependency like this guy was showing all the signs of a gambling addict, not a professional gambler, but a gambling addict. And that's where um, my mother, Dr. Carrie Randazzo, that's where her hypothesis comes from, because he was showing all those signs. But on top of that, OK, like when we talk about gambling or sex or food, um, any type of addiction like that, those are what we call process addictions because they're not chemically dependent to a substance, okay? Um, but there was an interview with his hairdresser that I shared this video on the Rewired uh, Souls
Facebook page the other day where they're interviewing his hairdresser. And she stated that multiple times he came in for a haircut when they first opened, 8, 9 o'clock in the morning, and he, he always smelled like booze, okay? And in the comments, I was a little rubbed the wrong way because everybody says, oh, that's normal. That's normal in that community. That's not normal. Like, we need to stop looking at these things as normal because when it comes to preventing the next tragedy, these signs might be slapping people in the face, but we're saying that they're normal, especially when it comes to alcohol, especially. And Chris, I would like, would like to define the definition of, of any addiction. All an addiction is, and listen, it's a pathological relationship with an object or an event. Mm -hmm. Let me say that again. Pathological, meaning abnormal, relationship with an object or an event. Yeah. So that could be sex addiction. It's pathological, meaning it's out of the norm. Yeah. And yeah, and okay. that's and I think that like so that word norm, we need to start rethinking what we look at as normal. You know what I mean? Like, um, well, I just I just did a video on the Rewired Soul titled, you know, Rock Bottom. I use celebrities as, as an example, but a lot of people, and maybe you can touch on this real quick, Mom, or maybe when we get into the slides, but a lot of people are thinking that he didn't have an addiction because he was making a profit or he had money. Like the example that I always <laughs> use is turning to celebrities. Two celebrities that I didn't mention in my YouTube video about this are Michael Jackson and Prince. These were guys, these were men who changed the music game. They are icons, right? But they died of drug addiction. We need to stop looking at success or money as a symptom of addiction. We need to start looking at this dependency. And Chris, I want to uh, kind of give some insight into myself. I, drank, I remember when I got drinking and it was getting towards the end for me. I remember thinking, I, I cannot save myself. No one would save me from myself. I was working full time in my profession. Mm -hmm. I was teaching at night and I was drinking every night and waking up having two jobs. I was the clinical director at a treatment center mm -hmm. and fact at a university. I remember that. So no, things do not have to fall apart. It is a spiritual, emotional problem. Yeah. And by the way, if anybody's watching this right now, sorry for glancing down. I'm just communicating with people and sharing the video and stuff. But if you're watching this, please like it. Please share it. Get more people in this conversation because we need to start educating people about addiction. Um, and also in the comments, if you have questions about addiction or especially process addiction, gambling addiction, sex addiction, like leave questions in the comments because I will be reading them and writing them down and we will address those um, later after we go through this slideshow. But also the way I, um, I simplify addiction is um, repeating any action, right, despite negative consequences. You know what I mean? Um, and I think your story is a prime example. I mentioned it in the video I did about how you got your PhD while being a full-blown alcoholic. You know what I mean? Like seeing, <laughs> seeing your story really helped me get sober because I thought my life was going well and I was a hot mess. So I had to relate myself to what you were going through and say, my, my rock bottom is now. It's not, you know, I lost pretty much everything though. So, but anyway, so what we're going to do is my mom did a presentation at her treatment center. Um, and we're going to kind of go through, we're going to explain addiction a little bit more. I might jump in. Um, this is going to be, uh, well, this is the first time my mom and I have live streamed like this, so it might be a little rocky. Um, I'm going to be going through the slides. Mom, remember to tell me when to switch slides because she, she can't see them. Uh, so I'll be going through them, and we're going to talk about addiction. But if you're just now joining us, please share this with other people because right now what we're going to do is we're going to go off this hypothesis of why the Las Vegas shooter, Stephen Paddock, did what he did. And as we progress through this, it's going to be like a puzzle where we fit these pieces together that possibly gives us some answers as to why this happened. So right now I'm going to move these screens around um, real quick. And so bear with me for a second while I do this. I'm going to resize these so you can still see my mother and my beautiful faces. Beautiful faces. <laughs> okay, 
So, all right, ah. all right, mom. So I do have the first slide up. All right, and also before I forget, okay. because I forgot to put this text in there, if you're just now joining us or you're watching the replay, in the description there is a GoFundMe link that was um, started by Casey Neistat, a fellow YouTuber. Um, if you can, please donate to the Las Vegas Victims Fund. I am promoting this because YouTube just demonetized his video and he was going to use that money to donate to the Victims Fund. So we all need to come together and donate to that GoFundMe to show some support for all of the victims. All right, Mom, so um, I do have the first slide up. So let's get talking about what this beautiful picture of the brain means. I think I want to open up a couple of, uh, a little bit before I go into that. Is that okay, Chris? Yeah, yeah, yeah go for it. Okay. Well, first I want to define addiction. Again, I want to start by saying it's a pathological relationship with an object or an event. An object could be a drug. An object could be um, alcohol or an event that could be sex addiction that could be gambling that could be a ton of things mm -hmm. all right next I want to say we know through science that addiction is a genetic you're genetically predisposed and I want to say that before we go on with this hypothesis you're it's a genetic predisposition that it has to get triggered off you okay it, it needs a trigger it needs a host all right so let's start with that now, the slide you have up is the mesolimbic reward pathway. That slide shows you exactly where addiction is basically located. It shows the prefrontal cortex, the nucleus accumbens, and the VTA. That, we also call that the reward pathway. All right? Many of those parts stick together to maintain a thing that we call homeostasis. And most mammals have this. It's, it's what keeps us alive. And homeostasis, you need to understand what that is. Homeostasis equals balance of an organism. It keeps us in balance. Let me give you an example. Um, Christopher, if you get the flu, say a bug gets into your system, you're going to have symptoms of the flu. You might have the chills. You might have a runny nose. That is your body's response to telling you something is going on mm -hmm. your body is going out of homeostasis okay those symptoms are getting you to try to balance yourself up rest take care of yourself get antibiotic mm -hmm. make sense okay the brain has a homeostatic center also and it's in this area okay the mesolimbic system is responsible for our homeostasis our brain balance OK, mm -hmm. that part of the brain is for life sustaining events. It's to keep the organism alive. It's to promote um, eating, drinking. It's the center that tells us we're thirsty. It's the center that gives cravings to eat. It also that area of the brain also tells us when we've had enough to drink or enough. to. Eat. It sends off messages. It's also responsible for sex behavior so the animal can procreate, mm -hmm. so we can keep our speech keep going. Yeah. All right? So it's responsible for sex. It's also responsible for nurturing mm -hmm. so that the animal can take care of its young because it cannot take care of its young, right? Yeah. So that nurturing part. Okay. Remember, homeostasis, it should all be in balance. Yeah. We should, it should all be balanced out. So the problem. No, go ahead. No, I just want to interject. I'm going to toss in um, just some stuff. because. So those of you who don't know, my mom and myself, we both work at treatment centers. First off, it's really cool hearing like you talk, I talk about that same stuff. But also, so anybody who knows who's um, watching this, if you're an addict, um, if you're an alcoholic, this is another reason why withdrawal happens. Because that balance is thrown off. You've changed your body's natural homeostasis. So once you stop drinking or using, your body is trying to urge you to get that back in your system. Neurotransmitters start misfiring and all that kind of stuff. But when we're talking about process addiction too, like in this case with um, the Las Vegas shooter, we're going to be talking about process addiction. When And my mom will get more into that about dopamine levels and stuff. But... When we don't do that action, that thing that we're addicted to, our brain is trying to pull us towards that. It's saying, you need to go do that. Because like my mom said, this is evolutionary, um, like it's evolutionary responsibility. And so we, when we're hungry, we know when to eat. When we're thirsty, we, we know when to drink. 
when we're feeling some kind of way, we know when to reproduce, if you know what I mean. Like, that's, that's the function of this. But withdrawal happens because this homeostasis is knocked out of whack. Am I, am I correct there, Mom? And plus other, there's a lot more involved with that, but ultimately elementary, yes, that's yeah. exactly what oh, happens. So now I'm elementary. And addiction, of, I don't mean to call you out. <laughs> uh, so, okay, so let me know, um, are we good on this slide or you got some more on this break? So, yes, now we're going to the next slide. Okay, got it. And I've already kind of went into this slide, so I apologize. I was talking ahead of myself. No, that's so cool. many. Yeah. Okay, so I've already talked about half this slide. Okay. So again, I want to say something. When it talks about, if you look at the slide, life-sustaining, um, life-fulfilling behaviors, we have Overeaters Anonymous. Mm -hmm. We have Alcoholics Anonymous. We have Narcotics Anonymous. These are all oral eating, drinking behaviors. We have Sex Anonymous, right? Mm -hmm. We also have Al-Anon. All these things, these 12-step these programs, they're all for is dysregulation of this system if you look at it. If you look at what the behaviors are responsible for, okay? Now, Gambling Anonymous is part of the dopamine system. And what I didn't add on this slide is it's also responsible for pleasure and aggression. Please understand the homeostasis or in the mesolimbic system is responsible for pleasure of a being, and it's also responsible for aggression. Aggression is that we can save our species. If an animal comes at me, I need to have aggressive behaviors to stop that animal from attacking my mm -hmm. young, attacking my fellow. Okay, so I didn't add that to the slide, so, but let's put that in. Yeah. All right. So I'll, I'll so, touch on that. This is a lot of where my mindfulness stuff, when I make videos about mindfulness. So I talk about how that part of the brain, our brain is constantly in two states, attraction and aversion. Okay. Pulling stuff towards us, we want more of that, or pushing things away. And what my mom's talking about, too, is that part of the brain, the limbic system, is responsible for fight, flight, or freeze. All right? And from an evolutionary standpoint, that was what helped us avoid danger. Like, if a, if a saber-toothed tiger was coming full force at you, were you going to fight it, were you going to run the hell away, or were you going to freeze and play dead or whatever it is? That's the part of the brain that goes all sorts out of whack, but it's also responsible for the pleasure that we get, right? Exactly. Cool. And the sad part is the last sentence on here. Addiction occurs because of dysregulation of this natural function, of this part of the brain, dysregulated. It does not work like average, your normal mesolimbic system. It is dysregulated. Now, this is at a level, this is not going to get fixed, guys. That's why addiction is a chronic, progressive, and fatal disease. Because this is an area of a brain we cannot treat. Yes. And this is, this is for anybody watching right now, this is exactly why we say addiction is a disease. Because it dysregulates this part of the brain. Right? Exactly. So, and that's the yeah. part. It's horrible. If have, is anybody, I, I know you guys, you, some of you are too young, but there was a movie called One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Mm, I remember Jack that. Nichols, yeah. What they did in the movie was they cut out a part of his frontal lobe, and then he just sat and drooled. They used to do frontal lobotomies. The reason for a frontal lobotomy is if you look at the, the brain that I showed you in the last slide, the main part of the mesolimbic system is in the frontal lobe. And our frontal lobe is responsible for a lot of these behaviors. Yes. Okay, remember that. Yeah. So, and one of the, and one of the issues is, is that it's also the newest part of the brain. Um, that's why we're at the top of the food chain because that prefrontal cortex part. That's what separates us. That's how we make these logic logical decisions. So remember that because I think that's going to be key to what we're discussing. That part of the brain is responsible for logical decision making. Okay, so don't forget exactly. that. And I, I don't want to over talk you because I get so excited about it yeah. because it's just fascinating. Yeah. The frontal lobe is responsible for certain things, and I'm going to tell you what they're responsible for. When, any, when I diagnose you with alcoholism or any type of addiction, this goes with it automatically without talking. Mm -hmm. First of all, your prognosis is poor. What prognosis means <laughs> is if it's not treated, it's, you're probably going to die from it. It's horrible. Okay. Okay. Your prognosis is poor in the areas of judgment. Remember that judgment, emotional regulation. Remember that emotional regulation, 
concentration and impulse control. Mm -hmm. Again, that part of the brain. Now, remember, I'm telling you the mesolimbic system is mainly located in the frontal lobe. You're going to have poor impulse control. You're going to have poor emotional regulation, mm -hmm. which means it's hard. You're going to look bipolar. Yeah. Your emotions are going to go up and down. You're gonna. It's gonna be hard to concentrate. You can do concentrate on certain things, and others you cannot. And your judgment, your judgment is off. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's just remember that. Yeah. So, so also, if you're just now joining us, um, we're talking about the Las Vegas shooter, trying to you know analyze based on what we know, and what we're talking about is addiction. So, those of you who missed the first part of this stream, this oh, wow. what my mom just went over. There yeah, I'm still here. What do you see? Are you seeing? Yeah, we're still good. All right, Mom. But uh, anyways, um, so what we were talking about at the beginning of the stream was addiction needs to be addressed before any other illness. I'm sorry, Chris. Something happened to our connection. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to – you're going to have to call me. Okay. Let me uh, – I'll reload this connection while I talk. Um, so anybody who's – watching. Uh, sorry about this. Technical difficulties. I'm recalling my mom. Um, do, 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 do. Alright, so that should help. But this is why this is why addiction needs to be addressed before any other symptom uh, of mental illness because it's possible that the person is acting in certain ways, depression, anxiety, uh, any of those other illnesses might surface because the person is having a problem with their prefrontal cortex based on their addiction. So hang out for a minute. My mom is now back. Now we can see your mom. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Are you connected to your Wi-Fi? Sorry. My mom is still learning technology, so sometimes I gotta walk her through this stuff. Yeah, I'm connected, but it's going and coming. So I apologize. I might be this might happen more than once. I saw okay. I'm sorry. All right. So let's move on to the next slide one sec and I don't know if you guys hold on one sec can you guys see my mom right now let me um one second uh oh for some reason I can't see you on here sorry for the technical difficulties no nope, it looks like we can nope no we cannot see her so hold on one sec mom while I do something one second one sec. I'm just getting my mom back on here. Window capture. Um, this is going to be... Where is Skype? One second, everybody. Crap. This card. Cancel. Cancel. All right, everybody. This is... Sorry for screwing this up. Just gonna try to, Mom. I'm gonna have to call you right back. Um, one second. And I'm sorry. Okay. Just hang with us. Hang with us for a second. So, anyways, if you're watching, please leave uh, questions and comments in there, um, because we want to make sure that we're answering whatever we can when it comes to addiction. Also, if you're just now joining us to. Make sure that you check out the YouTube channel because I'm always doing this stuff. If you're watching the replay, um, make sure you check out the description. And I think I got this figured out now. Cool. All right. Mom, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you see me? I think so. Hold on. Let me change this to... One sec. My mom has some dogs. Sorry, my babies are here. You know what? Here's what we're going to do. I have an idea. All right. Look, look, everybody. You can see my mom. Ha-ha! There we go. Okay. So let's go. All right, mom. We're on the next thing, the reward pathway. Okay. So let's Now, this going. slide, I want to explain. When it says drugs of addiction, um... I work at a treatment center. We do this presentation a lot regarding alcohol and drugs. I don't treat other addictions at the center, 
but this slide can go with um, other those other behaviors that the reward pathway is responsible for. Okay, so that could be gambling, sex. All right. So here we go. Drugs of addiction or behaviors of addiction. We identify them, all of them in our lives, by their ability to stimulate dopamine in the area of the limbo, limbic system. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. The dopamine is the pleasure chemical that's responsible in that area that gives us pleasure. All right. When we have sex, dopamine increases. All right. When we do certain behaviors, dopamine increases in that particular area. So drugs and behaviors that affect this area are identifiable by their ability to sto- uh, stimulate dopamine in that area. Does that is that understandable? Okay, yes. that sex, drug, food, hamburgers, whatever. And if any of you now, have questions, make sure you answer, ask them in the comments. Yeah, please, because I love this stuff. Yeah. This is my love. Okay, addicts. Any type of addict is identifiable. The reason I can say you're an addict, if I had a scanner that looks at your brain, is they are pers- a specific set of human beings that when given an addictive drug or behavior, they have a very unique response to these behaviors and they overstimulate or what we call hypersecrete dopamine in this area. Mm-hmm. Okay, so an average person is going to shoot dopamine because these are pleasurable if events. Okay, they're, but an addict, identifiable addict, is going to overstimulate dopamine. Mm-hmm. It's going to look like a Fourth of July uh, party, yeah. which makes dopamine reinforceable. For an addict, it is very reinforceable that pleasure you first feel. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that's what I, that is a subjective feeling. So people don't understand why addicts and alcoholics can, you can gamble for eight hours straight, or you can just drink until you just blacked out. It's because you cannot describe that surge of dopamine to people. It's a subjective feeling. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah. So yeah. just another fun fact for all of you, the, the prefrontal cortex, which helps regulate that flow of dopamine, that doesn't fully develop in women until their late 20s. Men, early 30s. Young people, one of the highest risk factors for addiction is the younger that they start using, the more at risk they are because of that hyper secretion. We start to get less of that dopamine flood as the prefrontal cortex begins to fully develop. Um, all right, you ready for the next slide? That's fine. Right. Yeah. So now we so are free- on. What's up? No. Oh, oh so you got it. Okay, cool. You got the printout. Okay, free- the switch. Okay, but I want to say that addiction, any, the average, the mean, we call it the mean in psycho, in science. The mean is the average. Your average person will turn into the, a full blown addict or alcoholic within approximately three to 15 years when they first started the addictive behavior or the addictive drug or drinking. That is the average. So out of 100 people, the average 50 of them. They would develop an addiction to gambling, sex, drugs, and alcohol between 3 and 15 years when they first tried it. Or you have your outliners that will become an addict the minute they start it. And you have your other outliners that they could do a drug or a behavior till they're 80 and not become an addict until then. Does that make sense? There's a switch. That means... When you use the drug, there's a biological predisposition that alters what we call, I'm going to describe the hedonic set point, uh, and it's a dysregulation. Is that the next slide? Arnie? Is that the next slide? No, just keep it on this slide, because okay. this is cool. This is cool, guys. Pay attention. Wow. When you turn into an addict, a crate. see, remember I told you the mesolimbic system is responsible for our cravings? To continue to drink and eat and and have sex, it it that mesolimbic system is responsible for cravings. It's also responsible for what we call satiation. Satiation means when I'm eating a hamburger, my stomach starts getting full. My mesolimbic system is sending a message to my stomach saying, "Carrie, you've had enough of that burger," and I get a full feeling. All right. Mm-hmm. If you have a dysregulated mesolimbic system, 
the drug starts losing its pleasurable effect and it becomes pathologically wanted because the starving and the craving and the satiation response is broken. Here, let me say that again. It's broken. So when I crave something, my craving is broken. Mm -hmm. Satiation is broken. So I don't know when to stop is basically what happens. There's more to it, but I'm summing it up very small. So craving continue despite having enough of the drug or the behavior. So let me let me stop you right there. Those of you just joining us, we're talking about uh, the Las Vegas shooter. And we earlier in the stream, we were talking about him have, being a gambler, okay? And a lot of people are saying, well, he was making money. So how can he have an addiction? Well, what my mother is talking about right now is that satiation. So if you are in the recovery community, if you're in one of the 12-step programs, you have probably heard this say, one is too many and a thousand is never enough. We never get that full feeling. Okay, there aren't enough drugs in the world to make us feel satisfied. So when talking about the Las Vegas shooter and his gambling, that means no matter how much money he was winning, no matter how much he was gambling, it was never enough. Is that safe to say? Oh, perfect to say. I mean, people say he has to say he's an addict. No, he does not. All I have to know is his history, and there's certain things I'm going to look at. Mm-hmm. I'm going to look at the history of his family. I'm going to look at some history. No. Can you imagine that poor uh, – I'm sorry. This uh, I've heard he spent $125 a hand. I, that could be a lie. Let's just pretend. You're at video poker. You're at video poker. Could you imagine the wins and losses, the feelings of dopamine coming and going consistently? Imagine that for eight to ten hours straight. Let's just imagine it. I wonder if anybody's done a behavior, any type of behavior, for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Eating, sex, aggression. What is the feeling? It's going to come and go. Just think of your own, your personal, your personal flight with just doing a behavior. Mm -hmm continuously yeah what's going to happen is the cravings and the satiation button breaks all right well uh, an example i always use because i've done this a million times and any other music lovers like have any of you watching this ever listened to a song so many times that you you eventually hate it right like that song was like your jam and then you just keep it on replay like it's not giving you that same like oh i love this jam like then you're like get that off the damn radio you know uh, we eventually quit getting pleasure from something like that. So, so yeah, and like my mom's talking about those wins as well as the losses. So to put it in, like, we really have to take a step back. And that's why we got to start talking about what rock bottom actually looks like. Because a rich person's rock bottom isn't going to look the same as the as somebody who's middle in middle, uh, like, uh, middle with, like, economics. You know what I mean? Like, their, their household and how much money they're making per year. So a millionaire, they're going to be gay gambling thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. But for me, like if I lose a hundred bucks, I want to freak out. You know what I'm saying? So we, we okay. need to, mm-hmm. no, go, go ahead. I want to, I want to, uh, let me throw this at everybody. Okay. Okay. I'm a, I'm a gambler. I love to gamble. Now, mind you, mind you, I'm married or maybe I have a husband or a lover or whatever. And he, they have a broken Mesolimbic system and maybe in the nurturing area, they're going to be a codependent. What that means is they're going to enable me. They're not going to see me the way I see myself because they're also sick. Okay? Yeah. They're going, all right, so wait a minute. We have so much here to, that I can look at and say, first of all, I can justify your using because it's it, that's what I've been around all my life, people that overuse and overgamble mm-hmm. and overeat. Over. So it's subjective. All right. Mm -hmm. So nobody's if if nobody and I I had it's a mental illness. If nobody tells me I'm getting sick or I don't have consequences, there's no bottom to be reached. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no bottom because everybody's allowing me to continue to kill myself. Yeah. So either by their enabling or their denial of their own disease. Yeah. Let's talk about that real quick. um, Bringing up codependency. They've been interviewing his girlfriend. We haven't gotten like her full uh, statements or anything like that. But the Las Vegas shooter's girlfriend has mentioned 
nothing seemed out of the norm, anything like that, but that's what their normal was. But she has Chris. mentioned certain things that he said, like laying in bed. I forgot what he was saying. Do you remember? Yes, he said, God help me. Right. And that's when my heart like, jumped to my stomach. And that fell to my stomach. Yeah, and that's where I don't I don't get why so many news outlets and people being interviewed are saying like nothing seemed out of the normal. Like if I was laying in bed with my girlfriend, like <laughs> and I was just like laying there and saying, God help me, she might think something's a little bit wrong. Hell, if I And was, I wanna say mm -hmm, go ahead. and Chris of all, we don't know if that's fact that that was said, but if that's said, that just strength is my already occurring hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and that'll with the next slide. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so I'm on the next slide, the hedonic homeostatic dysregulation. What's okay, going on here? Right. Okay. So because this pathway, it's intimately connected to various, the prefrontal cortex, like I said, the judgment. Remember, this is our the limbic system is our our survival of all mammals, of anything, okay? So, guess what happens? Our mesolimbic system thinks it's normal for us to use drugs and alcohol. So, judgment gets a line so we can have restoration of homeostasis. Eventually, our homeostasis or balance is using the drug or the behavior. It's necessary for our living, our brain thinks. To survive, we have to do this. Yeah. So the, the drug, the brain begins, begins to treat the chemical or the behavior as necessary for survival. Yeah. Our brains mixed up. So anybody here who's not an addict, but addicts know what we're talking about. This is why um, addicts continue to do stuff like um, uh, one of my best friends who passed away. Maybe a year before she passed away from alcoholism, she got into a fatal, like near fatal car accident. Like she almost died in that car accident. But the brain thinks that we need that behavior in order to survive. Okay, so for any of you who are not addicts or alcoholics, or if you are an addict or alcoholic and don't know why you kept doing what you were doing, it's because your brain is saying you need to do this in order to survive. I'll never forget when my mom found my little baggie of pills and she told me that she threw them away. I got furious. It was almost like she sucked the oxygen. It's almost like she said, Chris, you can no longer breathe. And I got into full aggressive mode. So that is what happens when we become addicted to anything. And in the case of the Las Vegas shooter, we're talking about gambling. So, Mom, I'm going to move on to the next slide. But anybody who's just joining us, we're talking about the Las Vegas shooter. We're putting pieces together. We're talking about my mother, Dr. Kerry Randazzo's hypotheses on this. And we're taking a look at it from an addiction standpoint and trying to piece this puzzle together to maybe, maybe get some answers. All right, Mom, I'm okay. at the hedonic set for Mm -hmm. I do want to add this. I cannot tell you. I've been in this profession for about 20 years. I cannot tell you how many husbands and wives have been in front of me. I cannot tell you how many mothers and fathers have been in front of me and said they did not know their son was shooting heroin or that their husband was using crack cocaine and these they did not see it i've watched the tears so this is real so if he was an addict and they're saying they saw nothing i can see it because i've seen the codependency and the blindness mm -hmm. it's sad but i understand it okay so now we're going to go into so we have this hedonic homeostatic dysregulation are you is the slide up uh, yeah I'm on, I'm on the graph and i have no clue what i'm looking at so walk me through okay, it I'm looking graph. Look at the middle line, Chris. I hope you could point to it. There's yeah. a, a line that goes straight across. It's horizontal. Yes. And it says, okay, that's a person's normal feeling. That's an average human being feeling normal. Not depressed, not happy, just normal, okay? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I'm looking at the slide, too. So I'm, okay. Now, let's say, now, let's start at that normal phase in the middle there. I wish I could point at it. No, I'm pointing. I got you. I got you, Mama. Let's say somebody has a drink. Uh -huh. An average person has a drink. What happens is you when you have a drink, as I told you before, dopamine increases. Look at that large blue line there. Yeah. Do you see the blue line? Up to feel good. <laughs> Any, that's the feel good. That's the dopamine that's going to happen to any normal person. Let's, As it's, and, and mom, just for the sake of this, let's relate all this to gambling. 
No drinking. So when, when this guy... Gamble. Hey, hey, who out there's had a gamble? I've, I've gambled. <laughs> All right. It feels good, right? It feels good. My dopamine increases. When I'm done at the casino, it kind of goes down because, you know, my dopamine's decreasing because now I'm going to go do the dishes and watch the kids. Mm-hmm. What will happen eventually is it's just kind of like a rebound effect. Your dopamine will go, uh, it kind of goes a little low for a second, but it quickly jumps back up. Uh-huh. Okay. So after we have sex, after we eat candy, this is a normal dopamine response to anything in the limbic system that we do. All right. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? That even happens to the alcoholic and addict. It's a normal, we call it affective response. Affective means emotional. Mm -hmm. Affect, emotional response. So are you following me here, Chris? I'm following you. I teach the same stuff. So I I will do a plug real quick. If any of you have not seen my video in... uh, on the Rewired Soul YouTube channel. By the way, if you haven't subscribed yet, I don't know what you're waiting for. Go over to the Rewired Soul YouTube channel and subscribe. But I have a video up there titled, Why Am I Depressed After Getting Sober? And what I talk about in there is that middle line that my mom was just talking about. That's us feeling normal. And after getting clean, we still have some of these ups and downs. So this is a little bit different. This is how these lines bounce around leading to uh, addiction and dependency. But it's kind of the same idea when I talk about depression after getting clean. So I just wanted to say that real quick. So go subscribe on YouTube. All right, Mom, what's this bottom dotted line? What, what are we talking about here? I'm going to go there in a minute, but first you have to understand. When we do behaviors over and over and over, the dopamine, everything's made by dopamine. This is a neurotransmitter. They talk. These are two dopamine transmitters. They talk to each other. This one makes dopamine. This one receives dopamine, okay? And these things continue to fire so we can feel normal. Well, when I continue doing any kind of addictive behavior or any behavior in the lim- limbic system, when I repeatedly keep doing a behavior that causes dopamine, guess what happens? Dopamine stops making itself, okay? Because it doesn't have to make itself because we're getting extra surges of it. Mm-hmm. The dopamine transmitter says, hey, chill out, dude. I, 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 it tells the cell, stop making dopamine. I got too much up in here. Yeah. Cut it out. Stop, stop making it. So now you're looking at what happens to an addict. Eventually, their hedonic set point goes below normal. Mm-hmm. So when they take a drug, they get a little bit of a bump. This is after years. This could happen the first time. They get a bump of dopamine, but it, it increase. It significantly goes down, and it goes down far, and it never really gets back to normal because the dopamine is now lazy. The neurotransmitter is lazy. It cannot make itself. So if you keep using drugs, alcohol, gambling for long periods of time, sex for long periods of time, pretty soon the high is no longer there. You have now taken your normal to a depressed level. Mm -hmm. That is normal. And you will hear people say, I stopped getting pleasure from sex. I stopped getting pleasure from gambling. Mm -hmm. I stopped getting pleasure. And this is the reason. And we call it an altered, dysregulated set point. Mm -hmm. Followed by chronic drug use, chronic gambling, chronic sex behavior, chronic eating and overindulging. Pretty soon people are significantly depressed. Yes. So, so this is something. hmm? No, I was just going to say, this is what we we talk about. Like many of you who have struggled with any type of addiction, drugs, alcohol, or sex, gambling, whatever it is. That's why we keep doing this because. Previously, we were talking about the limbic system and how that's our survival mechanism. So it's telling us to keep doing this thing, but we're no longer getting the reward for it. So we get miserable. We're no longer getting that high. We're no longer getting that good feeling, but it's in a part of our brain that says, I don't care if you're getting the good feeling or not. Keep doing it habitually or compulsively or because we're, we've, I I do some talks and treatment about um, how it moves from the nucleus accumbens to the dorsal striatum. The dorsal striatum, which is a part of the limbic system, is responsible for our autopilot. That part of the brain no longer distinguishes good or bad. It just says, keep doing it. So that, so what my mom's talking about, how that hedonic set point lowers, 
when we're talking about Steven Paddock, the Las Vegas shooter, like, we can't look at the fact that he was making money because that was no longer bringing him pleasure, is what we're thinking. Well, we don't know that. What it doesn't thinking. matter. If it oh, I'm sorry. Thinking. Hypothesis. All right. The hypothesis, I'm going to be devil's advocate. He still could have been getting a lot of pleasure. You see that some people in their addiction still get pleasure. They're just not getting the pleasure that they used to get. Mm -hmm. It's still pleasurable. Let's not say everybody, as you see, you're still getting a dopamine surge. It's not the dopamine surge you used to get. So you're chasing the high higher. Yeah. You can't get high enough. So I, I just want people to know it's not that he was miserable constantly. OK, yeah. I, I believe he was doing behaviors. I believe he and still enjoyed gambling. It just it wasn't at that dopamine level of pleasure. Yeah. OK. Right. I believe he enjoyed it, but not to the effect that he should have. Got okay? it. All right. So next slide. Right. I'm sorry I interrupted you. No, because no, I don't no, want to do the disc. There's various addicts. There's some addicts that still have pleasure. Yeah. It's just not the pleasure of that first time. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. And, and no, you teach me all the time. So just so you know, my mom is someone who helps teach me more about this. She's been in the field for what, 15 years now, almost, plus your PhD <laughs> school. Yeah, yeah. 20. So she's always teaching me, but I'm catching up to you in that knowledge. What's yeah. up? <laughs> so, so now we are on the hedonic homeostatic dysregulation. If anybody's just uh, joining, um, Albert, uh, one of the watchers that said chasing ghosts, exactly. Um, we do chase that original high, and that's something that we never get. Um, so now, uh, and if any of you have questions as we're going along, please leave them in the comments. I'm reading them on my cell phone. Uh, but yeah. Mom, let's talk about the hedonic homeostatic dysregulation. And by the way, real quick, if anybody's joining, you need us to kind of look, catch you up to speed where we're at, we will. So go ahead, Mom. Okay. So this whole slide, there's a lot to it, but I'm just going to uh, kind of sum it up to patients or clients or individuals. Let's get this straight. They know. They are very aware that they do not need the drug or the behavior to survive because they have that frontal cortex. But survival drives tend to take precedent over logic, okay, and judgment. This continued using or behavior slowly takes over what we call survival precedence. It takes over life goals, self-esteem, relationships, stability, safety, and health. So at the end of the day, if I see a client, I don't care what they're telling me. That's all what we call their um, their defense mechanisms. The brain is to keep itself alive. So they will say, I love my children, but all their behavior shows is that they don't, right? I mean, if you see an alcoholic, myself, I said, I love my kids. Mm -hmm. But I could not wait to get you guys in bed at night and start drinking. Mm -hmm. I could not wait to order you a pizza so the pizza delivery boy came so I could start drinking. Mm -hmm. so at the end of the day, yes, I look like a loving mother to a lot of people. They knew they saw me cry. But at another level, my drinking came first above all things. If you came up to me, okay, let's pretend I'm gambling, right? Let's pretend I'm gambling. And Chris, you came, I'm a gambling addict. You came up to me and it asked me to, for some money for a cup of coffee off your card. Yeah. I heard this. And I tell you to get out of my way. I've already paid for it. All right. Uh -huh. That's a clue that, hey, check it out. Do not bother me while I'm gambling. Okay. First of all, get out of my face. I, got, I left your card at the Starbucks casino. Go get your coffee, basically. Leave me the hell alone. I'm busy. Yeah. That is my survival mechanism. All right. Get it? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to do anything I can to keep you happy. If that's buying you coach purses, if that's whatever it has to take, because again, logic take a lot. I have addiction logic. Mm. I have fear delusions, we call them. We call it addictive reasoning, addictive logic. Yeah. I do not listen to what clients say, I watch what they do. Exactly. I also watch their faces. Yeah. Right. And that, so that's. I and um, yeah, when I was uh, when I was being forced into my sobriety by my mom and her lovely friend, her, this my mom's I'm friend sorry, Peggy, my, friend. my mom's friend Peggy is next to her, who is actually there, and I'll never forget when I, they were trying to get me sober. And they said, "Oh, that's his disease talking. That's his disease talking." But 
I, I can relate to that, and some of you addicts can relate to that, because you're trying to protect your addiction, because the addiction goes above everything else. So the fact that I hadn't seen my son in four months, the fact that I was losing my job, my money, and all these other things, those were towards the bottom of my priority list, okay? So, but like my mom was saying, too, we'll do things to kind of get you off our back so we can keep doing what we're doing, too. So, um... Next. Chris, I want to add this too. Just because I'm addicted to alcohol didn't mean the more I'm getting addicted to alcohol, I want to explain this too. The more anal I got about my, my PhD, the more anal I got about my papers, the more anal I would get on a topic and I would stick to it because my addictive logic, my brain was trying to homeostatic so I wouldn't kill myself. You're still trying to keep some balance with the outside world, okay? Yeah. So, it, um, patients kind of look like they have obsessive compulsive disorder. They'll keep a lot of things in their life clean. Their house is going to be perfect. They have to make sure these things are in order because the, the cortex is trying to save it. They're having an internal warfare with the cortex and the limbic system. I want to say that because it's really kind of goes to what I believe is going on. Here. Okay. All right. Let's check out the next slide. Okay. So talk to me about this circle. Your worst self. Okay, but I'm not before I get there. Now, okay, guys, that's about addiction. But I want to, this. now I'm going off into other psychopathology. But first I want to say, sum it up with, we also have a theory on the addictive personality. It is not in the DSM, but we know as you turn into an addict and you start becoming addicted, there are certain stages of your personality that begin to change. Due to this, okay, and I think I need to address those before I go into psychology theory. All right. Yeah. The first stage when you start addictive behavior is you go into the eternal state change stage. This is a stage of addiction that nobody would notice. You're instead of having natural relationships with human beings, we start addicting, or we have nat we start having relationships with objects and events. Whether that be watching TV, whether that be events, like whether we become start becoming isolative in what we enjoy. We don't like the, uh, being with other people, okay? Then we turn into the, what we call the lifestyle change. That's where we start these addictive rituals, okay? I know people that when they drank every Sunday, they had to go to Long's. They had to buy a certain amount of wine. They had to make sure it was there. They had to make sure their glass was there. They had to make sure this was there. We have addictive rituals. Rituals are binding. They bind us to our addiction. So if I'm an addicted to gam and mind you, I'm going to tell you this, casinos are wonderful. At they know the game. There are certain players. You are a premium player. Guess what you get? I get a room. I get a room and I get a nice room every time. And guess what? I get free food. They are causing our addictive rituals. I don't know if you guys are aware, but we get our per you get a per we get if we're in a gambler a <laughs> you get your own personal human being that calls you. Mm -hmm. So these are starting addict they're they know how to get an addict. Yeah. They're not trying to the average person, they are trained. That's what marketing is. Yeah. It's getting the person addicted. Yeah, and uh, so I, I highly suggest, if you haven't watched my video with Dr. Judson Brewer, um, he has a book called The Craving Mind. Like, something that you everybody needs to realize, like, even, even the apps on your smartphone, even on this thing right here, apps are designed to get you hooked, to give you little burst of dopamine. So what my mom's talking about is casinos know how to play that very, very well. They know how to well, keep you coming back. Chris, anyone who gets a degree in marketing understands addiction. They, they don't teach them it's addiction. They call it behavioral reinforcement. Yeah. But really, behavioral reinforcement, you're going at your limbic system. Okay? So at the end of the day, Stephen Paddock was set the heck up. I'm sorry. If he can get a whole floor in a casino to bring his family, they are just reinforcing my dopamine. Uh-huh. Let's so I'm telling when, anyone. When it comes to huh? uh, explain this to me psychologically and um, let's talk a little bit about his aggressive behavior real quick, since we're on the topic of um, 
the getting into his gambling at the casino. So there was a story that he was at, I believe, the El Cortez here in Vegas. He gambled, lost twelve thousand dollars, had like an epic like freak out, and was telling he was demanding that they give him like all sorts of free stuff. All right. Of course. So so how does that play into that kind of aggression right there? Uh because remember, the limbic system, it is an aggressive act, right? It's in the aggressive. That is also for survival and aggression, all right? So he's losing and gambling, and he's like, how dare you, you jackass? Now you owe me something. And I bet they gave it to him. I'm sure they gave it to him. He needs to get reinforced his dopamine. Give me the free room. Give me the coffee. Give me the $200 meal. It's going to feed his dopamine again. He was... Again, addiction, what happens is you start getting this internal struggle, the dopamine's, the dope, his dopamine's falling. He needs his surges of dopamine. He's getting what we call inside the addictive process. He's getting what we call the spiritual emptiness. So, and that's where I get the rest of the slide. So, but. almost so to relate it to drugs or alcohol, it's almost like when somebody's not getting their high or they can't get their drug of choice, they're reaching for something that will give them that. And I, so correct me if I'm wrong, but can this also explain why addicts, when they first get clean, they're reaching for other things that give them dopamine, typically relationships oh, and sex? Yeah. Oh, you should see them. They'll do sex. They'll come in. Now they want tranquilizers. Yeah. If they're off the heroin, now they want extra Suboxone. So, I mean, I could. this goes on and on and on so and on. So in the case of a gambling addict, when he's losing, not getting that dopamine from winning, that, it, that might explain his freak out when he wasn't winning and started demanding things because those are different okay. things that give him the okay i would i would just laugh like dude you set this up you better give him everything he wants now remember i'm going to get into this hell in my head yeah all right, all right. Okay. Cool. oh so um i have okay. the your 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 worst self circle up and i don't know if you've seen this one but walk us through this Okay, it's this is kind of advanced, you know, going into a different area of psychology, <laughs> but I guess I need to explain it as this. Carl Jung is a, a psychologist, very famous, one of the founding fathers of psychology, and he talks about every human being. We have these archetype, an archetype. He said he did research and he found out that in various societies, even in third world countries, we all have these archetypes of good and evil. And how did he study that? He looked in third world countries and he noticed they had these things of the good, the good person and the bad person, just like we do. We have um, the angel and the devil. OK, he noticed every culture had these kind of good and evil things going on. So he believed that we were all spiritually kind of a connected way with good and evil. Every human being had the foundation of good and evil in some form. Does that make sense? Yes. I hope can you hear me? And we call these archetypes, all right? We call them archetypal, that we all have this good and evil, uh, good and bad, good and evil, whatever you want to call it. It's not based on religion or anything. We call it just a belief system. It's a spiritual belief system. He also noticed other things. We, uh, they're called archetypes, and he noticed them throughout every society and every human being. All right. So you have to understand that to go to the next level I'm going to go to is Carl Jung talked about we all have a spiritual connectedness that for us to connect to the universe, we attach with one another. We have this this kind of this good and bad that we feel between each other, this this kind of this energy we have. Those are also it's a it's a connection. We call it a spiritual connectedness. Okay, you have to understand that theory to understand and the dopamine to understand addiction takes away that connectedness of human interaction. Uh -huh. It eats it away because of the dopamine. This spirituality we have between us, this caring and, and these, this empathy we have, addiction eats that away. And it's based on the dopamine. Now, if I look at this, this gentleman, Paddock, the first thing it said was his father was on the FBI's most wanted list. When I saw that, I thought, poor kid, because I have to take I have to be what I call empathetic. I have to, as a psychologist, put myself in the other person's shoes. I have to look from their eyes. OK, to understand them, I have to see out of their eyes. Mm -hmm. All right. 
what I know of this gentleman is he was raised by his mother who was single. What I also have heard, and again, this is all conjecture, I don't know if it's true, that he was told his father was dead. Whether he was told his father was dead or his father was on the run from the FBI, basically, this gentleman had no father. Every human being needs, okay, I'm sorry, it's important that we have this male and female archetype. These mm -hmm. things we look up to as male and female, nurturer and their, okay. Things happen. I believe that what happened is he saw his world in his eyes, this worst self. If I don't have a foundation to know what a healthy parent is, I'm not going to know how to grasp onto that. And what's going to happen is I see my, if my father abandoned me, I want this father, but I also see him as unloving. It's this kind of love-hate relationship. Mm -hmm. I try to deal with it, but a loss of a parent, and we know this in developmental psychology, every child, every child needs a connection to their parents or some form of a male and female, all right? Because without it, we are lacking certain qualities. Mm -hmm. There are things that are missing in us, all right? Carl Jung then talks about the worst self. This we start to break down. We're starting to, we're, everyone wants a connection with that other person. And it, we start to break down. I really believe, you want me to just sum it up? Because this thing would go on and on and on. Yeah, and I, yeah what do you believe? <laughs> I go into Stephen Paddock's mind. The man that abandoned him also was a spectacular man. He was on the FBI's most wanted list. This guy escaped prison and was on the run. However, I did look into this gentleman. He also had another family eventually when he got caught and he did his time and he had a new family. I don't care if P Stephen Paddock was 30 years old. Those losses and those cr crushed him emotionally. It has to. It would crush anybody. It is. It is. It would cause me what I call cognitive dissonance. He had this hate, plus the addictive process, plus he liked collecting guns. You know, people collect a lot of things. I think, personally, I think he got suicidal. I don't. I think he got suicidal a long time ago. But in his addiction, we grasp for life. The human being wants to live. But as we know, addiction, you want to kill yourself. Some people say they don't care if they don't wake up. What I really believe is he got to a place where he was going to die. But, Dad, I'm going to go out a lot better than you. I'm going to go out more famous than you. I'm Dad, you're gonna, I'm going to make you proud. Now, mind you, he doesn't connect to humans like we do. This was horrendous what he did. But he has no connection to human beings. So when he's shooting in that crowd, he is not thinking of the mother he's killing. He's not thinking. He was in an addictive logic. Mm. This man wanted to die, but God dang it, Dad, I'm not going out a punk. I'm going to make a name bigger than you ever did. And I believe he wanted to die. The stuff in his car, I don't know if he wanted to escape. I still don't know. But I believe even if he escaped, that car was a bomb. He was going to bring it and he was going to blow. He, I have no doubt in my mind he did not care if he died. None. This is, again, my logic. But over time, I've seen this. This is my theory, what I think. Now, if you had, I'd love to see the toxicology report, mm -hmm. okay, because that adds to his addictive thinking. If he has, if he has substances in there, this all magnifies it by 10. Yeah. Okay? All right. So, Chris, that's kind of what I think. Yeah. But well, and that, that, will makes, be revealed. that makes sense, too. And, by the way, anybody who's watching, like, sorry for... I've been trying to make it so my mom and everything, I'm trying to organize this stuff. But no, like, dang, that, no, that was really, that was, that's that's really good. And I hope most of you have watched this whole thing. Or if you're watching the replay, I hope you made it this far. But no, that makes sense because that's, that's what I teach a lot too. And that's why I teach a lot about mindfulness and developing the prefrontal cortex. And we have that disconnect with people, with other people. Um, one thing that I talk about a lot is uh, that video about um, 
you know, Rat Park and how the opposite of addiction is connection. Well, one of the issues is that we just don't feel connected to other people. So when you talk right. about his his gambling addiction, I don't even think like when we're talking about his gambling addiction, I don't even think that that's a theory. I think that's pretty well known. Um, I, as we mentioned earlier in this stream, I don't think it's in any way accurate to say he was a professional gambler. This guy was a gambling addict. To say that that's normal in those communities, well, in those communities, we happen to have a lot of gambling addicts. The same way in homeless communities, we have a lot of alcoholics and drug addicts. So, um, and like my mom was talking about, these places are designed to get you hooked in by giving you these perks, giving you these bonuses, making you want to come back so you get some more free stuff and all those things. But that disconnect, and like you were talking about, like it really, I'm glad that I was able to do this with you because that sequence of going through addiction and how it develops and how it works. And when he was doing this, he wasn't seeing as what these people were. He wasn't seeing them as people. He wasn't seeing them as a mother who has children or as a daughter who has parents or as people who had friends and family. He was doing an act to try to, like you mentioned, to outdo his father. And what, what, just kind of blows because of the loss he felt, of the loss. He wants a connection. You're ready to kill yourself. You're in this ugly place, Chris. He loves his dad and hates his dad. We know this. This is love hate with every parent. His love hate was huge. You know, I wasn't in, I can't tell you for sure because I can't talk to him, but I would love to know were you trying to make daddy proud or you were you trying to tell daddy to fuck off? I'm not quite sure. That's where I'm stuck. I don't know if he was trying to make daddy proud or telling dad to fuck off. I'm sorry to cuss, yeah. but I want to tell you who I blame in this whole thing. You want to know who I blame, Christopher? Oh. His family, his friends, society, that people want to make excuses that we, the addict is ill. It is my responsibility when I am in recovery, when you are not sick, when you don't have this disease, to help the one that is struggling, to see the signs. Yeah. That's who I blame. This guy was a sick, he was an ill person. Yeah. No, and that's... For us to justify, for us to justify casinos, I'm not saying I hate casinos. They're wonderful. They're great. I'm not... I'm not hating bars, but if you have this illness, if it runs in your family, these are red flags that need to be looked at. And that's what that's what hurts me about this whole thing. Yeah, no, and that's why I keep doing what I'm doing with the rewired soul, like, and soon I think you'll you know, here's what I'm thinking. And if any of you are watching this, give a give a like or thumbs up. Like, here's what I'm thinking. We could do this like every Sunday where we just talk about something, you know? But this is why, because and I, I think like personally for me. For me, like when I get uh, a little down, like, oh man, my YouTube channel isn't as big as I want, or I don't have as many followers, or people aren't watching as many of my videos, it's because of what you just said. Um, see, like you, you're a little angry about this. Me, I'm a little sad about it. People just don't I know. Get, they don't I get upset because, but Chris, I get upset because where's our responsibility for education and prevention? We've had this dare, yeah. don't drugs we don't educate on yeah. the addict is ill why are we expecting them not to do they can't stop themselves yeah i have to go chris every day i go with a flag i am a, a fighter for addicts and alcoholics i would not go to work if i thought they were evil people yeah. the family members come in there and I, we try to educate them and you know what they do they say this is not our problem mm -hmm. hey he's making money yeah and uh, like, I'd like to have. Yeah, and that's that's part of that's part of the issue. So like, um, and yeah, that whole idea, and that's that's one of the reasons why I, I beg all of you, like anybody watching this, anybody who watches the replay, like please share my videos, please share them, get this addiction education out there. We need to be better at spotting this because if we find out, okay, remember this video is a hypothesis about how addiction led to this mass killing. This is a prime example about how what you think is not your problem really is your problem. You know what I'm saying? When addiction goes unnoticed that long and it turns into a yeah. mass shooting, this is everybody's problem. Um, when the drunk driver 
okay? Like, if we were to take um, a look at every drunk driving fatality involving an innocent bystander, how many of those families could we interview where they turn a blind eye to that person's drinking problem? It is all of our problem. This is why we need you to share these videos to talk to people, to get educated about addiction. And why, um, you know, I did a video a couple weeks ago how, about the Las Vegas recovery rally. This needs to be more normal of a conversation because there's this idea that addiction only affects that one person. No, it affects all of us. And I'm going to eventually do videos about how it affects the economy, how it affects insurance premiums, how it affects all these different things. Because when people start seeing how it hits close to home, then they're like, okay, now I want to do something about it. But in this specific instance, if, like, remember, there's a big if, because this is still a hypothesis. If but I'm this, pretty smart, Chris. I, and you are, you are a smart lady. Well, why do you think I'm so smart? I came out of you. But, <laughs> <laughs> but if we find out that this man's addiction led to almost 60 people dying and over four, five, over 500 injured, then this is a reason why we need to start educating more people about addiction. This is also yeah. why we need to start talking more about codependency, too, because some people are covering up another person's addiction for that same reason. Okay. Can I say this? Mm -hmm. Okay. I watched an FBI woman get on and talk, and she said a lot of times mass murders like this the explanation you'll get is not that sensational. And I believe that's going to happen here, that he's not in conspiracy with, there's no, she said she's been in the FBI for a long time, and most mass, these people that do these things, it's not sensational. But however, I want to let you know something. I want everybody out there to hear me. You're going to have a lot of psychologists getting on, and they're going to be talking about his mental health illness. I want to, so again, repeat what I started with. They know better. They know in our diagnostic manual, they must address addiction before they address any other illness. And you watch in my own profession, they will not do that. Yeah. They will ignore addiction and they will go to the mental illness, even though we know it's a top line illness that we have to address first. I want to I just I want to I want that. Yeah, <laughs> I want to wrap this up in the next 10 minutes or so. But. Let me ask you this, since you are in, in the field and you're, uh, you have your PhD in cross-cultural psychology, like, why do you think that is? Why do you think so many doctors, so many psychologists are not doing what this says and they're looking at addiction first? Why, if, if the tool they use, like, real quick, like, I, I, I'm a guy of analogies, right? Like, I used to work in the car industry, car service industry, right? Like... If somebody told me, if somebody told me that their windows weren't working, if their windows were not rolling down, the first thing we have to do before tearing the door apart is make sure that the child lock is not on. That's the first thing you do. You know what I mean? Because it saves a lot of time and it helps us get a lot of answers, right? So these are car mechanics. Now we're talking about psychologists and doctors who make way more money, who have gone to school way longer. Why are, not they, why are they not addressing this first thing that we're supposed to look at? Why do you think that is? Chris, I was in school 10 years. Do you know how much of addiction training I got? How you much? want to really know? I was trying to talk to them about this in group the other day, but let me know. How much? A semester. Barely. A semester. And it, and it was addressed in our psychopathology classes. Barely. Because we're trying to learn. If you look at the DSM, I wish I had it. The book is this thick. Oh, yeah. we, okay, we got tons of stuff to learn. That is the least that we're looking at. And it's so, I that's my only excuse I can say. So, well, I mean, we talk about this in our profession that you're just not trained. Even physicians, they're trained in cardiology. They're trying to save a heart. They don't have time to look at, oh my God, if I if that guy's an addict. Well, let me, it's just very hard. Let me ask you this. In the state that the United States is in, with an addiction crisis, mainly revolving around opioids. Why have they not switched the way we're doing that? Like, rather than a semester on addiction, why is there not a year on addiction? Just, but based on the state that the country is in, wouldn't that make the most sense? Okay, Correct. especially because based on studies, based on studies, more people alive right now. Not only are more people addicted than ever before, but more people struggle with anxiety and depression 
than ever before. Why are we not looking at addiction? Because that might be fueling their anxiety and depression. Like, how... How in 2017, how is that not bumped up to the top of the list? Because I understand that. Doctors have, when, when a doctor, when I'm talking to a doctor and all the knowledge that's stored up in their brain, it blows my mind. But why is addiction not that priority yet, based on the current state of the nation? This is what I'm going to tell you, Chris. I say we do another one of these if people want them next Sunday and we talk about that. Because this can go on for another two hours. <laughs> I think okay. We, no, that's what we're going to do. I think that's. I think we should stop where we're at now because it's a lot of information. Yeah. Saute it. Send me messages. Yeah. And then I like that. I like doing this. I don't know if people like hearing you and me me babble like people you. Love it. What are you talking about? We're awesome. Yeah. I, no, I can't see the comments. Give Do you a, see the comments? Give, a, give a thumbs up if you enjoyed this. Give a thumbs up. There's plenty. There's got to be plenty, I know, or even on the replay. But no, people um, people, people okay. do want to learn Mental this stuff. Health is tangible where they can be surgically repaired, treat, and later measure the success. Yep. That's why. Yeah. That's weird. Let's, well, let's, we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, that's the, right. Yeah, and let's talk about let's yeah because right. I do want to I do want to start doing this uh, once a week because I also want to switch it over to a podcast and stuff like that. But anybody. Uh, I, I, to Albert, that we do have the best specifics to diagnose you. We do. We've done a lot of research, and there's a lot of statistics. And there's, I want to, I'd like to direct everybody to the American Society of Addiction Medicine. These are medical people that are specialized in addiction medicine. Yeah. So there are, there are tangible ways. No, we cannot surgically repair, but we have medication now. We have a lot of other ways. And, can and by the way, everybody, like uh, most of you watching this have seen my addiction uh, uh, Ask an Addict series on uh, YouTube, on my YouTube channel. If you haven't, go over there. I have an Ask an Addict series. Like always ask me questions. Um, leave comments on those videos. Ask me stuff because I will go do those research. That research because I love learning about this stuff. My mom is still learning how this whole thing works, but they should be turning to me as a source, and then I will redirect you. So uh, come to the YouTube channel because there is a lot of information that I give, and I try to break it down into layman terms because I am not a doctor. I just take this stuff, give it to you. Uh, but there are so many resources out there, and uh, yeah, I do encourage everybody to get educated about this stuff, and that's why I encourage you to share these videos and everything to educate more people. Like right now, the education system, I'll end with this, the education system is not doing it for us, so we got to do it for each other. You know what I mean? And if one out of every 12 people is an addict or an alcoholic um, in some way, shape, or form, that means if you are watching this, if you are currently watching this, someone you know is either an addict or they're in recovery. That is just st statistically true. Someone you know, because most people know at least 12 people, someone you know is an addict or an alcoholic, either in active addiction or in recovery. So, again, everybody, like, we're going to wrap this thing up. Everybody, thanks for watching. If you're watching on the replay, thanks you're awesome. Every, anybody who's actually stayed here the whole time, even more thumbs up. But also, remember, check the description. Casey Neistat started a GoFundMe page for the victims of the Las Vegas shooting, this goes to the families, it goes to the victims, it helps with funeral costs, it helps with medical bills, it helps people get back on their feet. You need to remember that there were mothers, there were fathers, there were people whose children um, now need financial support, so I'm trying to help raise money for that GoFundMe. It's in the description. Um, I will be uploading this to YouTube, but anybody who has questions, Please leave them in the comments, even if you're watching the replay, because my mom and I will probably be doing this more often. But, Mom, you're amazing. I love you. Thanks for joining love me. You. All right. I love you. But uh, that's all we got, everybody. Thanks so much for watching. And make sure you go check out the YouTube channel, uh, because I got all sorts of good stuff on there. All right. I'll see you all later. Bye. Bye. All right, now that she's gone, no, I'm just kidding. I was trying to turn this off. All right, love you guys. I'll see you later.